Good morning. You got to respond, people. There's not too many of you out there. Good morning. There we go. Thank you. Welcome to New Brunswick Church of Christ. Good to see you. Not a bad day for January. You got to always look at the bright side. Any visitors? Anybody we want to recognize? I'm sorry I don't remember you folks' names, but it's good to have you back. I know you you came with Bert. I think Bert must be working or something, huh? But it's good to see you. Anyone else? We're glad you're all here. And welcome back again anytime. Um, several things I'm going to mention here that are this morning, but they're in the bulletin, so you might well be aware of them. But if you're like me, you need to be reminded. Um, youth groups is starting back up again tonight at six, so everybody involved with that. Um, kids church, it isn't dismissing yet. I'm just letting you know they have two classes now. They kind of divided it between the little ones and the older ones. So just to kind of be aware of that and, and they'll go later on when, when Jason's dismisses them. Um, if you'll notice, there's an insert in the bulletin, if you will, about the prayer chain. They're kind of trying to get that started, not not started again, but kind of revitalized, I guess, with different people that would like to be involved and stuff and whatever. And that's a pretty important thing. We all know we need prayer, and that's kind of a good way to find out when someone's got something going on and keep us in touch and in prayer. Also, I guess there might be still a few poinsettias out there that need a home. So if you know someone that need would like one, be or yourself, be sure and Help yourself to that so they can be put to use. Um, anything else? John's usually up here with something, and I'm lost without him. Any, uh, yeah, anybody need communion? Brad's coming up this way. If you didn't happen to get it in the back, he'll uh, get it to you now, so you'll have it later. Hey, Pat, hold it down there, would you? <laughs> no, she just got here, and she's excited. That's good. We're glad to have you and everybody that's with you. Well, that's a good surprise. Thank you. Good to see you all. Yeah. Yeah, he looks familiar. <laughs> good, to, good to have you all with us. Um, if there's nothing as far as announcements, so we'll move on to the morning prayer. Any uh, any prayer thoughts? Good to see Patsy back with us. Yes. You're welcome. Glad to have you with us again. Any Anyone else that we would want to mention before we go to, to the Lord? Once again, we're glad you're all here, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll begin with a prayer then. Thank you, dear Lord, for this day that you've given us for the opportunity and the freedom we have to be here. Thank you for everyone that is here this morning. We pray we'll receive a blessing from being here. We pray for our service this morning as we sing and, and uh, share communion and, and Jason, Jason leads us in your word. Help us to have an open heart and open mind, Lord, to what you have for each one of us. We know there's something there that we can all learn from and apply to our lives and, and grow and draw closer to you. Thank you for our many blessings. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for this church and what it means to all of us. And we pray for many that are on the prayer list. We mentioned recovering from things, going through all kinds of different things. And uh, we thank you for loving and caring about each one of us. And we just pray for everyone's health and, and safety and in the winter months and dealing with the corona situation. We pray for our country, Lord, too. The events of the past week and so forth. And there's a lot of unrest and difficulty, Lord. We just pray that everyone would turn to you and you would guide us all in the way that we should go. We thank you again for Jesus, for our shut-ins. We pray for them. We know that times are difficult and they're a little more at risk with the situation. But again, help us all to remember that you will take care of us no matter what. 
Thank you again for everything that you bring to us. We know everything does come from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. We're so glad you've joined us today as Jason shares with us the message, the sin that no one wants to talk about. Psalms 100, 1 through 3 says, Let the whole earth shout triumphantly to the Lord. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. God wants us to serve him with our whole hearts. Please stand as we sing together.
3 through 4 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain i could not climb in desperation i turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished. The end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven, the King of kings calls me his own, beautiful Savior. Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation. sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me then came the morning that seal the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the 
grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. Thank you, ladies, for a very fitting lead-in to communion. What a great song, Our Living Hope. So it's the second week of January. We just survived one of the most stressful times of the year, the Christmas season. We purchased all the gifts. We got together with family. We traveled, the cost, the time. Then January 1 arrives, and we strive to make goals and set resolutions, goals to eat better, lose weight, goals to be kinder, gentler, goals to spend less time uh, in front of the TV and more time with family. And yet, social science says that 50% of these goals will be lost or cast aside by January 7th. Then there's the stress of the world. One only needs to turn on the TV and be stressed out over the political unrest this past week. Now we're back at our jobs, and back at school. Things are extra busy. The to-do list piles up even while other things get neglected, which leaves us feeling guilty or distracted. The demands of life don't go away when things get busier. None of these things by themselves are overwhelming, but together they run us dry and wear us out. I am sure you probably get weary at some points. And the odds are you are probably weary here this morning. In one sense, this is normal. Jesus said we will be weary in Matthew chapter 11. And in this world, we will have troubles, as John promised in chapter 16. Peter said that we will have burdens and anxieties that we will carry in 1 Peter. But Peter also tells us to cast those burdens and anxieties on God because he cares for us and will carry them. Jesus assures us that through him in this world, we have troubles. Our peace is found in him. Jesus invites us to come and find rest by resting in him. Listen to his words in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. When we come to the table of the Lord's Supper, we are coming to find a rest at a sit-down meal where we are served rather than serving. Though we approach mood, food and meals with a fast food mentality of getting and eating our food quickly so we can move on to the next thing, the Lord's Supper forces us to take a seat with others pause and take notice of what's set before us. When we set our minds on Jesus and his broken body and spilled blood for our sin, our souls are restored by what we have in Christ. Though our sins are many, Jesus purchased through his death complete forgiveness and a full cleansing. 
Not only is every sin paid for, but the ground of our standing before God is based on Jesus alone, not how good or bad we were this past week. Despite our sin in Jesus, there is rest because we are forgiven and freed. There is also rest in Jesus through whatever valley, trial, worry, or fear we face today. The bread and the cup are a reminder that if God gave us Jesus, the most costly gift of all, he will give us everything else we need. If God saved us and made us his children through Jesus, if he defeated evil and our sin problem, then we can trust he has also good plans for us and will carry us through whatever we are facing today. If he gave us Jesus in our sin, how much more will he take care of us as his children? Despite our burdens and trials, there is rest in Jesus because we are loved and cared for. Communion is not a message about what we need to do, but what has been done for us. It's not a message about our ability to solve our problems, but God's ability to, in kindness, to solve them. The gospel then frees us from carrying the weight of the world and the weight of our spiritual walk on our shoulders because God is taking care of us, providing for us, and at work in us. Rest in him today. Be still before the railroad by resting in Christ. Any burden, sin, trial, or weight that you carry, cast it on the Lord in prayer. As you feel the bread between your fingers and sip the juice, remember that Christ is our provision and that we can trust him. Find your rest in him. Let's pray. Lord, we, we sing hallelujah just as the song before proclaimed. And that you defeated death once and for all. And that we have victory for you once and for all. Lord, I pray, Lord, that we will lay all of our burdens, all of our weariness at the foot of your cross here today. And that we will remember what you did for us. This is a time for us to reflect on what you have already accomplished. Lord, I pray that we will uh, be freed from our sins because of the salvation that we have through Jesus. Lord, we celebrate here this morning the good work that Jesus did on the cross, the freedom and the salvation that we have for all of eternity. And we, it's in his name that we pray. Amen.
Good morning, church. The kids are dismissed to go to class. I want to start my sermon this morning with a text out of Matthew's gospel. I've got uh, two texts I want to use this morning. One's a little bit longer than the other one. The other one will just be a single verse, which I'll read a little bit later. And in this particular text here, Jesus is giving us a glimpse of what Judgment Day is going to look like for each and every one of us, all of us, no matter whether we're, we're a Christian or whether we're not. This is what he's describing is going to take place, and every single one of us are going to go through. So it comes from Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. And Jesus said, But when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. Before him all the nations will be gathered, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then the king will tell those on his right hand, Come, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. These are the people the world was created for, is what, he's, is what he is declaring. For I was hungry, and you gave me food to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you as a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer them, Most certainly I tell you, because you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire which is prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you didn't give me food to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't take me in, naked, and you didn't clothe me, sick and in prison, and you didn't visit me. And then they will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and didn't help you? And then he will answer them, saying, Most certainly I tell you, because you didn't do it to one of the least of these, you didn't do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment but the righteous into eternal life. I told you once, uh, just a few sermons ago, about how I was walking through a store back in Utica, Ohio sometime last year, and I, and I saw a t-shirt for sale that, uh, that really sums up the mood of our society. Uh, I think we've seen it very clearly over this past week. We've seen it for the past year. But emblazoned right, just to remind you, emblazoned right across the front of this t-shirt, it said, I am everything that I need. I've mentioned this one other time, but I'd like to elaborate it on a little further today. Now, it doesn't matter how inaccurate or ridiculous that statement actually is. The fact of the matter is that is what truly many people believe. Most of us, I would say. Because we think that highly of ourselves. And in the civilized world, we are probably the worst in regards to this philosophy because it is this doctrine of individualized humanity that has been hammered into us from grade school on up for decades in every single arena of our lives. And as I, re I remember as I walked by that shirt, my mind started thinking about just how arrogant and how ignorant and really stupid, we must actually really be as a people, as a whole. I mean, if you take spirituality, excuse me, spirituality out of the equation for just a moment, it's still really just a kind of a stupid saying, what was written on that shirt. Because human beings are actually entirely reliant on everything around us just to function, and even much more reliant on our surroundings to stay alive. I mean, I want you to think about it this morning. If you are everything that you will ever need in this life, then go ahead and stop drinking water. Let's see how long it takes before you dehydrate. 
and then you die. And if you're truly everything you're ever going to need in this life, then stop eating. But let me know how it feels when your stomach brings your mind to a fast and hard reality check and shows you just how reliant you actually are on the nourishment and nutrition of food, which in turn makes you reliant on farmers and grocers making a minimum wage that sometimes we treat as lesser than us, even though we're, they're certainly reliant on them. And it makes us reliant on fertilizer and soil and water and good weather and hard work and you name it, we could go down the list. It's like a domino effect. And let's talk for a minute about how we are 100% reliant on oxygen to live, which means that we need trees. We're relying on them to produce it. And in turn, trees need us. They need what we're breathing out. For them to be able to produce oxygen. You see, all life forms on earth are established as interdependent upon each other. None of us are separate. Uh, even, you know, even secular Disney understood this concept several years ago when they, when they put out that cartoon. Um, I think it was called The Lion King. And they had that song in there, The Circle of Life. And it was talking about how we're all 100% reliant upon each other. And those are just some of the things that we are physically reliant on. But what about our emotional reliance on things other than ourselves? A few years ago, it, it started, well, more than a few years ago. I'm still living under the delusion that I'm in my early 20s and I'm, and I'm really not anymore. Uh, but more than a few years ago, it became... Uh, popular to start using animals as a means to improve the health of the elderly that were in nursing home settings that maybe were struggling with uh, loneliness. Uh, you know, th what basically what they would do is they would bring an animal in and they would pet it. They would check their blood pressure before and afterwards, and they would actually see a, a change. They would see their blood pressure start to regula regulate uh, just by having this interaction and something that they could set and pet and love on. I remember when I was a teenager, I, I worked in a nursing home in the, um, the kitchen uh, for a little bit of extra money when I was in school, and I would go in in evenings, and sometimes on the weekends I would bring this little dog that I had, and I would go into some of the rooms of the residents that, that I knew liked pets, and I would bring the dog in, and they would, you could just see them light up when they would see the dog, and, and it would help them. They needed the interaction. They were lonely. I remember, I think it was last Christmas, there was a commercial that came out, and in this commercial, it was, it was actually a German commercial. It wasn't American, but it was... It had such an impact that uh, many people were floating it around on social media over here, and they had it translated. And basically what happened in this commercial was it shows this older man uh, over in Germany, and he's, he's sitting down at a table all by himself, and he's, he's wanting his children who are all around the world and his grandchildren to be able to come back home and spend Christmas with him. And so as the commercial goes on, they're, they're, he keeps coming home from wherever he's going, and he's listening on his answering machine, and one after one, he's hearing all of his children give reasons as to why they can't come home. And so then it shows him sitting on Christmas Day at this big, long, empty table by himself with his head down. And so then around the next Christmas, the commercial cuts, and all of his kids start getting the notice that their father had passed away and when the funeral was going to be. And so they're all, they're all very sad, and they're all very discouraged that they had missed the last opportunity to go be with him. And so they all come home. And uh, they walk into their dad's house, and they see the table, and it's got food on it, and it's got candles lit. And then their father walks around the corner, and he said, well, how else was I going to get you all together for Christmas one more time? And you know, the company behind that commercial played on the emotions of the viewer, knowing that we all need interaction with other human beings for our own well-being. Now, you, you might say that not everyone is that way, that some people are natural loners, and they don't like the company of others, and they do not need social interaction with others. I say that I don't care how antisocial a person is, we all need interaction in order to be emotionally healthy. Shelley's dad is, is probably the epitome of I am everything I need. Uh, he, he says all the time that he could live like the Amish, or that, except he'd like to be more isolated than them, that he could just go out somewhere, uh, build a cabin, be by himself, and and, and just take care of himself and be away from everyone. Now, that's what he says. That's what comes out of his mouth. But I remember a few years ago when we did our mission trip to New Mexico, I know that he was worried that we were going to end up moving there because it's so far away from Ohio uh, because he knew that I liked it so much. And so um, not long before we left, I remember him coming to me and, and basically asking me that question and begging me to really come back like we had planned to do. And this is coming from Mr. Tough Guy 
I don't like having anybody around me. But he was begging me to bring his daughter and his grandkids back because he wanted the interaction. And you know, just as we aren't everything we would ever need in a physical sense, and just as we aren't everything we would ever need in an emotional sense, we also are not everything that we would ever need in a spiritual sense either. Yet you wouldn't know that if you walked into most churches in America today. Because the same lie uh, that you are everything that you will ever need has pervaded even inside the church, even inside Christianity. Oh, oh, we believe that you should go to church and being a part of the organization itself is important to us, but we don't talk much about what it means to actually be a disciple of Jesus Christ anymore. We don't place a high premium on what our behavior as a Christian should actually look like according to the Word of God. The Christian doesn't even hear many messages on the topic of sin anymore. And part of the reason for that is because there are so many conflicting doctrines out there regarding sin in Christianity that it has people confused about what they believe. The church has really messed up the world when it comes to this. They don't know what to believe because they hear so many different things coming out of so many different buildings depending on what the name on the sign says. You've got one wing telling you that you can reach a point where you can never sin again. You have another one telling you that it doesn't matter even if you do sin because you're still going to be okay. And another telling you um, another yet that there's a quick fix for sin so that many feel that they can just do what they want whenever they want then confess it to a priest and go right back out do it again and start the cycle all over again and other churches still who actually teach that there is no such thing as sin in the first place so people don't know what to believe and even if a church is talking about sin there is still one sin in particular that I never hear a message preached on in fact, I don't think I've ever heard a sermon preached on this particular subject. And I don't think I've ever seen it come up in a Bible study either. Uh, we can call it the sin that no one wants to talk about because it doesn't fit into our nicely prepackaged, sanitized, domesticated versions of Christian doctrine that each denomination has produced. We can't put it into a theological box. In fact, it's a bit untamed, and that scares us. We can't say that it's Catholic. We can't say that it's Calvinist or Westland or Armenian or any of the other silly titles that we place on the divisions of man that we have created inside Christianity because no one seems to have this sin factored into their formula. Yet you can find evidences for this sin all throughout the Bible and especially in the words of Christ that I read to you this morning. But just so there is no confusion about what I am referring to, I will read to you the most plainly ignored scripture in the Bible. The one that speaks on this sin that no one wants to talk about. It comes out of James chapter 4, verse 17. And this is what it says. To him, therefore, who knows to do good and doesn't do it, to him it is sin. You see, that sin is different for everyone. And it's not glaringly obvious to others where we can just look at a fellow Christian and recognize it as a misdeed. We can't throw it into a specific category and tame it or make excuses for it like we do for sexual immorality or theft or idolatry or adultery or any number of the other sins that we have listed in the church. We can't identify it with anything else that we know because it's going to be unique for each and every one of us. It truly is a matter between you and God alone, and no one else. You know, several years ago, and I've never forgotten this, I, um, I was uh, back around the time I was working in that nursing home, actually. There was a girl that I was, I was dating, because I was still around the time I was in high school, and I remember going over to her house, and her brothers, I was there to spend time with her, but her brothers were watching something on TV, and it was one of those adult-themed, inappropriate cartoons. Uh, but they had it on in the room that I was in, and I remember this one scene from it, and it struck me, and I've never forgotten it ever since. And sometimes uh, I believe that things that come from the world we can look at and we can say, hey, this is what they're seeing when they look at us, or this is what they're perceiving. And I'll never forget that in this cartoon, which definitely was not for children, it had this scene where this man got run over by a truck, and he dies, and he's at the gates of hell. And as he's standing in line, there's a demon there with a the clipboard. 
And the first person comes up and he, and he says, well, wait a minute, what am I doing here? Uh, I'm, a, I'm a Methodist. Why, why am I here? And so the demon looks through the clipboard and he says, well, I'm sorry, that wasn't quite the right church. And so he, he sends him into hell. And the next one comes up and says, well, well I was a Presbyterian. He says, what about me? And so he looks through the clipboard, oh, not quite the right one either. You're going on. And it kept going on through denomination after denomination until they picked the one that was the right way of thinking. And I really think that most Christians actually believe that that is an accurate description of what is really going to look like on Judgment Day. That Christ is going to look at us and say, well done, my good and faithful Baptist. Come on in, because you had it all together. That you held on to the right dogma, so come into your word. Or, well done, my good and faithful Calvinist or Wesleyan friend. Your church doctrine has bought your place in the resurrection of eternal life. You see, just like in the other areas of this life, we think that our own individualized dogma is everything that we would ever need. Spiritually speaking, we've got it worked out to a science, really, in a lot of churches. Uh, the perfect formula. You say a prayer. You get baptized, and then you continue on like nothing ever happened, as if we are everything we would ever need. We don't need Christ after that point. We've done everything we need to do. But you see, Christ is looking for something a little bit deeper than that. He is looking not for someone who has every single theological T crossed and I dotted perfectly, but for someone who has sincerely surrendered themselves to him. And if you have truly surrendered yourself to God through Jesus Christ, then that sincerity is going to show through in our actions. You will become his disciple. And no, you won't be perfect, but you will be making a conscious effort of striving for that life, to look more and more each day how Christ looked when he walked this earth. You know, we have that image in our heads um, that, that we all have created about Judgment Day, just like I saw in that cartoon all those years ago, and how we think it's going to go down, and what we think that God is actually going to say to us when we get there, and how he is going to honor us for, for having all of our uh, stuff wrapped up with a pretty little bow like a present under the Christmas tree, and being in the right click. But in our reading this morning, Jesus totally wipes out that man-made visage, and he tells us exactly what is going to happen on that day. And it's not going to be the Presbyterian separated from the Methodist in judgment. It's not going to be the Baptist versus the Church of Christ. The whole world, it says, is going to be examined. All of the nations are going to be brought together, and it's going to be the sheep, which are the true disciples of Jesus Christ, that in sincerity recognized their total dependence on God and actually served him, separated from the goats. Those who felt that they were everything they ever needed in this life, physically, emotionally, and spiritually speaking, and could have cared less about being a servant of Jesus Christ. And then after he separates them, he is going to ask them a few questions. And the surprising thing is, is these questions are entirely unrelated to church dogma, but have more to do with what the book of James refers to as pure religion, undefiled. And he's going to ask them, when I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was thirsty, did you give me a drink? When I was a stranger, did you take me in? He's going to ask me, Jason, did you clothe me when I was naked? Jason, did you go visit me with, when I was sick? Jason, did you come minister to me when I was in prison and I needed someone to share hope and share the gospel message? And we're going to look at Jesus and we're going to say, Lord, when did we have that opportunity? When did we see you walking on this earth? And then he's going to answer them saying, most certainly I tell you, because you didn't or did, depending on the circumstances, do it to one of the least of these. You didn't do it to me. The two greatest commandments that Christ gave while he was here. That we would love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that we would love our neighbor as ourselves. That we would do the work of Christ. We would be his hands and feet in all things. James chapter 4 verse 17 again. To him therefore who knows to do good and doesn't do it. To him it is sin. Ladies and gentlemen, God is not looking for just a stone-cold doctrine from us this morning. He is looking for sincerity and truth and an actual relationship with us. 
I want to give you an analogy this morning of what I'm talking about because I'm not downplaying the importance of having right doctrine. But you see, my knowledge of women in general, this is, the, this is the analogy I'm giving. My knowledge of women in general and of my wife in particular knowing about her doesn't create a great relationship between myself and my wife. That's not what does it. It helps. It's a nice starting point. But to have to actually pursue her is what I need to do in order to have a good relationship with her. And the same is true with God. We've all met people that can quote the Bible forward and backward, left and right, yet they sometimes are some of the worst examples of Jesus Christ and Christianity that we've ever seen. I was one of them for a very, very long time. It's why the church in America is in such a mess in this day and age. And this is the same message that the Apostle Paul, because we can quote the Bible, what I was trying to get at there is we can quote the Bible left and right, we can know what's in there, but that doesn't necessarily mean we're actually living it. It doesn't necessarily mean we're doing what Christ told us to do. And this is the same message that the Apostle Paul was trying to get across to the Corinthian church that was also a mess, just like the American church is a mess, when he said to them, if I speak with the languages of men and angels, it means it doesn't matter how clear I say this message. It doesn't matter if I come down and, and I start speaking in a tongue that an angel gives me and you all are able to understand it and you know it's from God. That's what he's saying. But I don't have love. I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. It means his message was absolutely worthless. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, think about that, to remove mountains. He had that kind of faith. But don't have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my goods to feed the poor, and if I give my body to be burned, but don't have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient. And is kind. Love doesn't envy. Love doesn't brag. Is not proud. Does not behave itself inappropriately. Does not seek its own way. Is not provoked. Takes no account of evil. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. And endures all things. Love never fails. James chapter 4, verse 17, to him therefore who knows to do good and doesn't do it, to him it is sin. What sins of omission have we all committed lately? What lack of love have we shown to others and by default not shown to Christ? What do you individually know? Again, I said this is not something that any of us could point out. I couldn't point it out in you. You can't point it out in me. What do you individually know that God is asking you to do today that you keep putting off or rejecting entirely because you're too tired or you're too busy or you're too proud or you just don't want to do it? Is he telling you to help someone that you know is in need? Has he placed someone on your heart to go spend some time with? You know they're lonely or they've got some problems has he told you to step out of your comfort zone and go witness to someone about him i can tell you a, 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 I can tell you a classic example of how i failed in this very recently on christmas morning uh we we drove to ohio and back and it was going to be eight hour round trip we didn't have much time for anything else and uh, we were on 70 headed towards ohio and the car right in front of me uh tire blew out and they pulled over on the side of the road and for the first 30 seconds, I kept thinking to myself, I need to pull over and offer to help. It was a very miserable day that day, cold, and the, the weather wasn't very good. And I really felt like I needed to go help that person. And I kept thinking, no, we're on a tight schedule, we're on a tight schedule, and I kept going. And then as I saw an exit coming up, I thought I should really turn around and go back and see if that person needed help. I didn't know who they were, but I felt the Lord telling me that that was something I needed to do, and I didn't do it. That's what this is talking about. That's a sin of omission. Has he said, go feed the hungry or go start a prison or a nursing home ministry or go visit the shut-ins or send them a card if you can't see them? Or is he telling you to offer forgiveness to that person that you just 
can't seem to give it to you. What do you think he meant? I've said this before, by take up your cross and follow me. I'll tell you exactly what he meant. He meant that this is not going to be an easy life. It's going to require something of all of us. The sin of omission could be any number of things for you or for me as an individual. I can't call it out for you. Only you know it as only I know my own. Because this sin is deeply personal and it's individualized, all I can say for sure is this. You and I are not everything that we will ever need spiritually. We both need the grace of God through Jesus Christ. And we must also truly allow that grace of Christ to have its way with us in our life. You've got to let it transform you. We need to be, I need to be, you need to be born again. If you would... Bow your head with me this morning. We'll go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you again for this opportunity that we have to come into this house, Lord, to open your word. Lord, to see what's in there. And Father, one thing that is clear to see from Genesis to Revelation is that your heart is a heart of goodness and a heart of mercy. That you care for us. That we constantly, constantly let you down. We constantly do the right, wrong things. We constantly choose selfishness. We constantly don't look after others' needs. We just look after ourselves. But even through all of that selfishness, you sent your son to show us the way, to show us how to be selfless, to how to serve instead of to be served. You, the God, the creator of all things, came to serve. Father, we thank you for that example. We thank you for these words that we've, we've opened up and we've looked at today. And I ask, Lord, that, that you would remind all of us, remind myself, remind everyone within the sound of my voice of the importance of what it means to be your child, that we bear your image to the rest of the world and that they're looking to us. They're getting their information about you many times by looking at us. So, Father, I pray, Lord, that I know, Lord, that we're still human, we're still fallible, we still make mistakes, but I pray, Lord, that you would just be with all of us and give us a new passion as we leave this place to remember the words of James, which come straight from the heart of his brother, Jesus Christ. Lord, that whoever we see and whatever we do, we should be doing it as if we're doing it right for you and right to you. Remind us of that today and in all situations. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Please stand. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. Just a reminder, there, there will be youth group tonight, correct? Okay, there will be youth group tonight. Um, if you would join with me in the benediction this morning, let the words in my mouth 
and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Yeah.